Thank you. So, kia ora everyone. I'm Vicky Telford. I work at Nurse Maud Hospice Services with a couple of roles. And as I get to the end of my nursing career, I can say I've reached the pinnacle of working alongside residential care colleagues in the delivery of palliative and end-of-life care. So as Te Ara Whakapiri facilitator, I started that role with the Liverpool Care Pathway in 2009, and it's now morphed into Te Ara Whakapiri with the same intent to enable end-of-life care to be as good as it possibly can be. My other role, I work in a park service, which is a palliative age residential care service. And that is a seven day a week service, working alongside age residential care, including dementia facilities in the delivery of palliative and end of life care. Very privileged. So, Te Ara Whakapiri is the last piece of the puzzle today, really, and in some ways the easiest, if shared goals of care and the MDT have been completed. Person and family are prepared, conversations have taken place, wishes are known and documented. However, there will always be the potential for complexity in the dying time, and Te Ara Whakapiri is a tool that can assist. The unifying path, bringing people together, working together, so a multidisciplinary approach to best practice for the last hours and days of life for people with a life-limiting illness, including dementia. It's used in a variety of settings, including home, hospital, hospice, and age residential care. The document itself was first published in 2017 and is available on the ministry's website. A review and changes were made to the original plan in 2020, and this version is used throughout the South Island and parts of the North Island, and is available to be downloaded on Health Pathways. Why? Regardless of which version we use, the intent is the same, to use the Te Whara Tapawha Universal Principles as a framework framework, sorry, to guide and individualise care. It's a palliative approach which supports quality of living and now it's changing its focus to quality of dying. Which comes down to diagnosing dying and recognition of a transition to the last days of life can be challenging and especially in people with dementia who are often on this slow decline for a number of months. This next slide is one that I use often and it just helps put things in perspective. So on the outer circle, we're looking at anybody living with a life limiting illness, like dementia, time frame looking last months to years of life, with a focus on improving and encouraging quality of living, looking at early symptom management, starting the conversations that are so important to make the things better in the last hours and days of life. If we do it in a timely manner, then we usually get it right. Introduction of a palliative approach and palliative care services at, at this time. And then looking at the last weeks to months of life. So declining function, goals of care may fluctuate, may need to be revisited. And then looking at quality of dying in the last days of life, Te Ara Whakapere, the use of, looking at active pain and symptom management, anticipatory prescribing, conversations with the family, etc. So, Pre-active dying can come under the general deterioration list there of profound weakness, reduced food and fluid intake, difficulty swallowing, mostly bed bound. And then getting closer to the dying time, active dying, increased drowsiness, reduced level of consciousness, sometimes terminal restlessness, increased cyanosis and mottling of lips, fingers, 
can be respiratory changes like chain stroke breathing or ataxic breathing. There is always uncertainty around when death will occur, but people dying with dementia mostly present, as the slides show, they settle into dying. It's a situation of a deteriorating body catching up with a deteriorated brain. Time frame can be challenging, and an often asked question, how long? It is a very brave person who gives predictions. The dying time can be quite prolonged in people with dementia, and so predictions are always tricky. Also remembering that a person with dementia may well have other diseases, such as chronic illness or cancer, which will influence the dying time. And sometimes people die suddenly. And sometimes people recover from dying. The how. So when the multidisciplinary team in consultation with the person, if able, and the family whanau, agree this is likely to be the last hours and days of life, Te Ara Whakapiri is commenced. The goals of care for the baseline assessment and ongoing assessment are listed under the Tafara model, ensuring that not only the physical needs of the dying person are addressed, but also the spiritual, emotional, mental, cultural needs, and also the needs of the family. So this is the 2020 revised document, somewhat different to the Liverpool Care Pathway, which was 13 pages long. However, as I mentioned before, the intent is the same, to make this dying time as good as it can be for the person and for the family. We'll discuss more of the goals in the slides coming up. And this is the ongoing assessment which is used for both versions. So are the goals listed being achieved? What interven interventions have been required to meet these goals? Has there been a need to seek extra help to achieve optimum outcomes? Yeah, assisting them with personal hygiene. Okay. So breaking down into the goals. So Tinana, physical well-being. So we need to assess the physical needs at this dying time. Is the person in pain? Are they restless? And put strategies in place to manage. Review current medications. Often people are unconscious at this time and oral medications aren't an issue. But if they are still able to swallow we need to have the medications reviewed and any that are unnecessary at this time stopped. And interventions, looking at interventions, do we need to be doing vital signs when somebody's actively dying? I suggest not. How often should we be doing a position change when somebody's actively dying? I've been around a long time. In my day, we turned everybody to Ali. That's what I was trained to do. With the use of Te Arafakapiri, that practice has changed somewhat. And the ongoing assessment makes us do a skin integrity check, which will inform us on how often we need to be doing a position change. So basically, I'm talking about individualizing care here. An often asked question is around bowel management when somebody's actively dying. If somebody hasn't had their bowels open for four or five days, should we be doing something? And the answer is, if they're not symptomatic, probably not. The next thing that will make life easier all around is anticipatory prescribing. And when I'm talking about anticipatory prescribing, I'm meaning subcutaneous PRN medications for five symptoms that might occur when somebody's dying. So that's pain terminal restlessness, respiratory tract secretions, nausea and vomiting, and breathlessness. Now, people will die with some of these, maybe none of them. Best practice is we have medications available to manage 
That means the person's not waiting while we get things prescribed, etc. So it is best practice. If somebody was already on an opioid, we would go straight to a syringe driver because if they're unable to swallow, we need to be able to give those medications. However, best practice is to titrate using PRN subcut until we get somebody to steady state for something like pain management. Morphine is sometimes a bit of a bad word for people and it has a bad name that it might be hastening death. We often need to have a conversation with family. Actually, morphine will not hasten death. It's actually a means to keep somebody comfortable if that person is dying, but not from the medication. Terminal restlessness may or may not occur, not to be confused with normal restlessness that can occur. I had the privilege of attending um, a session with some dementia care uh, uh, staff and they were talking about some of the residents and how they died and one of the care staff mentioned a woman who didn't normally do this but on the day she died she was calling out to her mum. Not something we would need to be using medications to control, a normal part of her dying process. However, if there is terminal restlessness, there are medication guidelines available, whether that be midazolam or clonazepam, et cetera. Respiratory tract secretions, another issue for families, and it's a conversation we need to have to reassure them that it's far worse for them listening to that than it is for the person who's actually actively dying. The use of oxygen for breathlessness, do we use that? Tend not to because it's a bit of a barrier in terms of a mask or nasal prongs. And we know a small dose of morphine will help settle that breathlessness. But it's not all about medication. So in the symptom management guidelines that can be downloaded locally, on Health Pathways and also on the Ministry's website, there are non-pharmacological guidelines as important as pharmacological guidelines. And just before we leave medications, there is a sublingual option for those five symptoms that can be used um, as successfully as subcutaneous. And the guidelines for sublingual management are being updated at the moment and will be available on the Hospice New Zealand website. The provision of food and fluids is often a very tricky area for families, and I think particularly with dementia. So often families visit and help their loved ones with their food and fluids because it's something they can do. And when people stop eating and drinking, which is a normal part of the dying process, it can be very a, a struggle for the family and requires the conversation around, actually, they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, and let's maybe start doing beautiful mouth keys. If there's any complex needs happening, then specialist palliative care should be approached. So that there's measurable practice improvements from what's happened with the introduction of an end-of-life care plan around anticipatory prescribing is now commonplace. Stopping unnecessary medications is commonplace. But more importantly, there's evidence that the important conversations are taking place and being documented. Okay. Kininaro, mental well-being. Is there an ACP in place? Has there been a shared goals of care conversation? What is the person's voice? What is important to them? What are the person's current mental state and their coping strategies? The Hafono, family social well-being. Ensure that the family and Fano are aware of the person's changing condition, having that conversation. Discuss family customs and traditions and cultural needs. Provide information to the family, for example, understanding the dying process. And there's a wonderful resource that's been put together by the New Zealand 
Dementia Foundation that's available on the website for families. Identify any communication barriers. Consider involving an interpreter if required. Uh -huh. Wairua, spiritual well-being. Provide an opportunity for the person, if able, and the family whānau to discuss what is important to them, particularly cultural and spiritual beliefs or practices. What do we know about the person dying? What was important to them? What is important to them? Is it music, pets, religious beliefs? Incorporate these factors into the care plan where possible or coordinate access to specialised cultural or spiritual support. So in summary, the baseline assessment provides a comprehensive overview of individualised care going forward. And the ongoing assessment gives a snapshot of whether the goals are being met. It is important to continue with the clinical or progress notes to provide a narrative of the dying time, a source of rich information. Documentation of the plan of care is completed by a registered health professional. The non-regulated workforce are often the main providers of the care and their input and documentation is vital for an MDT approach to care. So preparation and care after death. There's no rush, there's no rules. Family whanau should be provided with practical advice on what to do when death occurs. Do they know about funeral planning? Is there a brochure available around that? Do we provide a list of funeral directors, etc.? Preferences for after death are identified and documented. Cultural beliefs and wishes are identified and documented. And then for bereavement support. So grief for the family whānau of someone with dementia can be a unique experience. Loss, like for the person, is from diagnosis through to death and after. The following are a few thoughts from when my mum journeyed through dementia. The realisation that she didn't know me anymore, that she didn't speak anymore, that she didn't smile anymore, and numerous other losses. And then after she died, the sense of relief and associated guilt with that. The frustration and sadness of recollection of the dementia process and the inability to recall what an intelligent, beautiful woman she had been before. I suspect my experience is not uncommon. Mostly all of that will resolve, but some people will require extra help. So the resources, the one on the left, Tarawhaka Peri, Principles and Guidance for the Last Days of Life, was published in 2015, and it gives an overview for what adult New Zealanders should expect to receive in the last hours and days of life, best practice. The one on the right, published in 2017, has some wonderful resources, including a bereavement assessment tool, an algorithm around diagnosing dying, guidance for the medical team around management planning, looking at when death approaches, and also dying at home. The piece de resistance. These resources are superbly comply, compiled and include wonderful sections on staff support, which we aren't covering in this session today, but so important, and also supporting other residents through grief. These resources will definitely provide a very valuable guide for, last, for best practice for end-of-life care for people with dementia, and I know that I look forward to adding them to my armory. Thank you. Kura Vicky, thank you very, very much for um, the personal side of your story as well as that wealth of experience. Just um, no one has yet put in a specific question, but uh, so please do, folks, because there's time, and not just for Vicky's presentation, but any questions that you think would be of general interest as well as your own interest in relation to this topic. 
What I'd like to ask you, Vicky, is if if I'm sitting in an aged residential care setting as a say a lead nurse, or I'm sitting in a home-based support service setting, or even in a um, uh, at Fatawara Hospital or clinical team setting, and and I realise that my team doesn't really understand how to fuck a pity. We don't know about it. We're not experienced with it. Who who can I reach out to to um, to upskill our team with its knowledge and its understanding of Tara Whakapiri. What, what are my options? So I can talk definitely for Canterbury. So I think I'm the only dedicated facilitator left in New Zealand uh, from Liverpool Care Pathway days. So I'm funded for that role, which includes me going into 97 facilities educating 100% of RNs and also about 80% of the care staff. I also do education for the district providers in Canterbury as well. And in the acute setting, um, the palliative care team is responsible for educating. And we know that Te Whakapere is used very widely in the acute setting at Christchurch Public and also here. I would suspect from other areas that the park service that I'm part of would have quite a significant role in educating around Tarawhakapere and the girls from Southland I'm sure can answer that in the positive and I know in Wellington there's a similar service through the hospice service and also in Auckland, the hospice services. So yes, there will be education provided. There is access, as there is so, online, of course. Right. So besides the online side of things, we're we're also thinking about through the hospice network. We Absolutely. might, if, if they themselves don't run education, they might know who does. <laughs> Can you clarify for folks a little bit, Vicky, for those that may have missed it, uh, what, what is the equivalent of Tarawhakapiri for those parts of the country that are not using that particular version or that particular tool that um, we've been showcasing today? Okay, so the, the, the 2020 version that I did show was put together with a group from Siapo. And the reason that was put together was we did audit of the original 2017 document and found that in that it wasn't being completed as well as it needed to be. So we made some changes. So the 2017 document has a care after death section. It was not being completed really. So in our 2020, we put preparation for care after death. So we were having that conversation. So that's been rolled out South Island wide, and I field interest recently uh, from VHB in Wellington are using it. Parts of Auckland are using it. The rest of the country will be using the 2017 document. And as I said in the presentation, really, it doesn't matter which one you use. Basically, it's about best practice in the last hours and days of life, and both tools, both versions will meet that need. Um, thinking of all our speakers today, what is your advice um, to someone is, who's sitting listening and going, I, I get it, I get that shared goals of care uh, and and it, even if I'm not living, uh, you know, working in age residential care, the, the serious conversation guide and thinking about advanced care planning, I get it. I get that that would be a real step forward for us. Someone else is sitting listening saying, I get that trying to get an interdisciplinary team meeting going either regularly or as needed for specific clients, I get it. Someone else is saying, I get that Tara Whakapiri is a real step forward and we haven't been doing that. What are you, what are your thoughts about the next steps for listeners today who uh, can see that this would be great, but are feeling a little bit daunted by we've got these three tools and we might not be using any, or we might be just using one so far. What what would what would the three of our speakers today say in in the sort of how how to take the next step forward? I don't know, as first of all, shall I kick off? Um, I would say 
the next step probably is to access the amazing resources that have been compiled um, by Dimension New Zealand in the space. The whole reason for this webinar today is to share that. And they're an amazing resource, not only because they walk you step by step through the processes, but they also provide you with amazing links to resources and education that you can access. And a lot of that is um, available online so that some of those things you can do self-directed learning in those spaces and understand some of that. Within my sphere of sort of um, the Share Girls of Care Serious Illness conversation, we have trainers throughout the country that are working predominantly based with some of the um, Jitahuha Order um, teams, but um, often they're opening access to other staff that come from other sectors. So if you're wanting to do some practical training around some of those um, communication tools, there are opportunities to um, get in touch with your local teams and um, look at what might be available as in-person training in those spaces as well in your district. Thank you, Jane. Any thoughts, Margaret, in response to that um, issue? I think that if um, if you can see the need for this within your facility or your organisation, to make it a quality initiative to um, implement these three tools. I mean, I, absolutely, Jane's correct. Start by by looking at the tools. There are lots of people who are available to help you um, implement them and. For the MDT, you there are some there are some of us in Southland who are happy to uh, virtual in and give guidance. You can contact us through the um, New Zealand Dementia Foundation. Thanks, Margaret. Vicky, what are your comments about the the you know how to go the next step forward? Sure. So a, a wish list and something that will happen. So I'll start with the wish list, which has always been an online education tool about Te Whakapiri. The actual, not what we've done today, but more about how do you complete the ongoing assessment and so on and so forth. That doesn't exist at the moment. And I think before I retire, it will. The, <laughs> the, the other thing that is going to happen um, about the three tools is I've been on a little end of life working group and Jane Large has requested that, you know, could the three tools go further than the Dementia Foundation website. And I'm really pleased to say that they will sit on the Hospice New Zealand website, which has a, a hub, which all health professionals can go to. So it will be part of an education. This webinar will be part of education there. So that's getting the word out there. So yeah, that's all I really have to offer. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much to the three of you for just introducing us or reintroducing us to those three tools, but thinking of them as a package together so that we can help uh, our Fano and our people that are dying with dementia, not, not necessarily from it, but with dementia. 